see, if we go to the Bible, you will see Jesus when he was speaking to the Jews. He said to them, what do you say of the Messiah? He said, they said he is the son of David. Now, I mean, do you know how honor is to say I am the son of David for the Jews? This is the highest honor, the son of David. This is not any person for them. This is David, the, 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 the best king they have. And look what Jesus said to them. He said, well, if he is the son of David, then how David call him my Lord? So you will see how the difference is. The Muslims are desperately looking to be related to someone. The Messiah, he don't accept to be the son of David. Even in the Bible, it says by birth, he is from David. But he, in reality, he is not. He is the God of David. The Muslims are desperately trying to make Muhammad belong to the Jew. But is Muhammad even a Jew? Prophets no. of the Jews, they prophesy for somebody is a Jew like them. Not somebody is an Arab. But because they are desperate, they have a bankruptcy, they are trying to find a place for their child molester prophet and let us find a place for him in any shelf in the book of the Jews. The, the Messiah, he said, what is the benefit of you win the whole world and you lose yourself? So win yourself first. If we do what the world want, we will go nowhere and we will never be satisfied in anything. The world today is about how to make money, how to be rich. And the more you make money, the more you find that you are poor and the more you find that you are not happy yet. So finding the Lord that he is the only one you should believe in is the way for happiness. And when, when the Messiah, he wanted to wash the feet of his apostles, they said to him, what? You, want, you are our Lord. You want to wash? He said, if you don't let me do that, you don't belong to me. So in Christianity, my friend, the master is the one who serve. To be the to be the first, you have to be the last. They say that we are the one who worship a man. But look, our, our the man we worship, the Messiah, they think he is just a man. He is the one who wash our feet. And he is the God for us. We are the one who worship supposedly a man who is God. But the fact we are worshiping God who become a man, not man become a God. So Muslims, they worship a man. We worship God. And that his name is the Messiah, the Christ, who commit no sin, who his name is the glorious. And he himself is a miracle for God is a miracle of history. Read the teaching of Jesus and see what Jesus is about. The Christian believe that God died for them. So look, 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 look how different is Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus, he came to us to save us and even his life paid to save me. He did not ask me for return. Jesus, he did not ask for money. Imagine if Jesus, he can raise people from death. How many kings they will give him everything they have. All the kings in the world, they will be his slaves. Just keep me alive, please. Each time I die, keep me alive. If Jesus would abuse his power, which is beyond imagination, what Jesus can do? You see, the first thing Jesus teach you is not to be selfish. When, when they asked Jesus how to pray, he said, he told them, pray like this, our Father out of heaven. And then he said, forgive to us the same as we forgive to others. Jesus is anti-selfishness serve others so you can be served when jesus he said to his followers i want to wash your feet they said to him what are you talking about you are our god how you can wash our feet they refuse he said to them if you don't let me do it you don't belong to me imagine god himself who is coming to us as a man he is humbling himself and washing our feet why Jesus is doing that? He don't need to do that. 
This person is resurrecting people from death. Is this person is making the blind see? This person is amazing. People they are immune. Like I mean, what? Whoa, whoa! This man, what he can do? And then he said to them, "I want to wash your feet." Because Jesus want to give us the best example how you can be a follower of Him. If you want to follow me, you wash the feet. To be a master, you have to be a servant. You do what servants do. You don't do what masters do. People, they want to be masters to have servant. Jesus wants you to be a servant, then you are a master. When I look for dignity, I find Jesus. When I look for wisdom, I found Yeshua. And so this is, this is what I was going through as a Muslim encountering this information. At the same time, my Christian friend was introducing me to good reasons to believe in Christianity. I had been taught growing up that the Bible was corrupted. He showed me that that's simply not true. When I was saying that Jesus never claimed to be God, I would point to the Gospel of John and I would say, well, John's Gospel was written 60 years after Jesus died. You can't trust John's Gospel. You turn to Muhammad's life, the first biography written about Muhammad comes 140 years after he dies. How can I consistently deny the Christian message in light of the way the Islamic evidence works? Because Jesus, in a variety of different ways, directly and indirectly, made transcendent and messianic and divine claims about himself. He claimed to be the Son of God. At one point, he gets up before a group, John 10, verse 30, and he says, I and the Father are one. And, and the word in Greek there for one is not masculine, it's neuter, which means Jesus was not saying I and the Father are the same person. He was saying I and the Father are the same thing. We're one in nature. We're one in essence. And how did the audience understand what he was saying? They picked up stones to kill him. He said, well, you, you're just a man and you're claiming to be God. You can claim to be God. Anybody can claim to be God. But if Jesus claimed to be God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, uh, that's why the resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Christianity is an investigatable faith. And if you investigate it and you find that the resurrection is not an actual historical event, you are fully justified in walking away from the faith. That's how bold he was. Why should I believe Christianity is true? The first E stands for the word execution, that Jesus was dead after being crucified. And I learned very quickly as I did my investigation, there is no dispute among scholars in the field. And I'm not just talking about Christian scholars. I'm talking about the wide range of scholarship around the planet. There is virtually no dispute among ancient historians that Jesus was dead after being crucified under Pontius Pilate. Why? Because when we study ancient history, we're lucky if we get one or, or maybe two sources to confirm a fact. And yet, for the death of Jesus, we not only have multiple early first century accounts in the records that are contained in the New Testament, we've also got five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his death. We have Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans. Tacitus, another early historian, Meribar Serapion, Lucian, even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was executed. I mean, this is so well established of an historical fact. In fact, we could go to an atheist New Testament scholar, like Gerd Ludeman, formerly of Vanderbilt University, and he'll tell you this, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. We have early accounts or early reports that Jesus rose from the dead. In other words, reports that come virtually immediately after his death. Why is that important? Because like a lot of skeptics, I used to think that the resurrection of Jesus was a legend. And I knew it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world, so I figured 50, 100, 150, 200 years after the life of Jesus, legends began to develop. Mythologies were spun, stories were invented. And that's where this idea of the resurrection came from. We have preserved for us a creed of the earliest Christians. In other words, right there uh, in the first century itself, these Christians would rally around this creed based on facts that they knew to be true. 
Now this creed contains the essence of Christianity. It says Jesus died. Why? For our sins. He was buried. And the third day he rose from the dead. And then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses to whom he appeared, appeared including opponents and skeptics. Now what's important about this creed is how immediately it developed after the death of Jesus. Remember we said it took time for legend to develop. Well, we can date this creed. How? because the Apostle Paul preserved it for us. He wrote a letter. About 22 to 25 years after the death of Jesus, he writes a letter to the church in Corinth. We call it 1 Corinthians. If you want to look up the creed later, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. So he writes this letter 22 to 25 years after the death of Jesus, and in the context of how he writes it, it suggests that he had already given him this creed on an earlier visit, and he was just repeating it in the letter. So, we can date the creed confidently to within 20 years of the death of Jesus. The historical record tells us that Jesus' body was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, member of the Jewish council. It was sealed. Matthew tells us it's guarded, and yet it's discovered empty that first Easter morning. That, wait a minute, I'll tell you why the tomb is empty. The body was never really in it. Don't you know they didn't bury crucifixion victims? They left him on the cross to be eaten by birds, or they threw him to the dogs. They, they didn't allow them to be buried. That's why the tomb was empty. Well, wait a minute. I checked it out. What did I find? I found that when you read the Digesta, which is a summary of the Roman law and procedure from the first century, it specifically says that crucifixion victims, execution victims, can be buried. Not only that, we have in 1968, the remains of a crucifixion victim who had been buried that were discovered right there some, you know, from the first century. He was executed. They found him with a spike still through his ankle bone. And then just about two weeks ago, they announced the discovery of another crucifixion victim who had been buried. So we have archaeological evidence that, yes, some crucifixion victims at least were buried. And we have good reason to believe that's what happened with Jesus. Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people, to skeptics and doubters, as well as to believers, to men, to women, daytime, nighttime, to groups, to individuals. Uh, People uh, talked to him, they, they touched him, they ate with him. And of course, the historical record tells us This experience revolutionized the lives of the disciples. I mean, after Jesus is put to death, they're afraid they're going to get executed. They go into hiding. They're going to go back to the fishing business. And yet, history undeniably tells us just a few weeks later, in the very same city where Jesus has been executed, these once cowardly disciples are now proclaiming with boldness that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, He backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And they were willing to proclaim that message to their deaths. I started praying fervently to God, saying, God, can you reveal yourself to me? Can you show me the truth? And ultimately, God gave me a vision in three dreams, um, which showed me that Christianity uh, was the truth, that the gospel message was the true message. And I sat down at my couch, I pulled out a Bible and a Quran, and I put them both in front of me, and I said, God, can you just comfort me? Can you just comfort me? And I opened up the Quran. Understand, when Muslims recite the Quran, they usually do so liturgically. They don't know what they're reciting, for the most part. So this was the first time I went to the Quran for personal guidance, to exegete it for personal guidance. As I'm flipping through its pages, I realized there is not a single verse in the Quran designed to comfort a hurting man. Not one. Sure, there's plenty that say, if you repent, Allah may forgive you. Sure. But there's not a single one that says, God loves you regardless. And so I put the Quran away. I said, this doesn't apply to my life. And and this time I I was actually turning for guidance. And I said, well, Christians read the New Testament. I'll, I'll flip to Matthew. So I opened up Matthew chapter one. It didn't take me long to get to Matthew chapter 5, which says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Those were the exact words I just spoken to God and it felt as if the page was electric. It felt as if the word of God had jump-started my heart. I actually like, couldn't let go of the Bible. I was this is amazing. I read the next few verses and it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. And I'm thinking, I do hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm, I'm not righteous. I want to be, but I'm not. But God will bless me anyway? Why is that? Why will God bless me even if I'm a failure? And all of a sudden, I encountered a God who loved me regardless. Like my father loves me, so does God. In fact, far more so. And this unconditional love was mind-blowing to me. And I finally get to Matthew chapter 10. And here's what I read in Matthew chapter 10. He who confesses me before the people of this world, I will confess before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before the people of this world, I will deny before my Father in heaven. You see, I I had all the evidence, I had all the spiritual guidance through dreams and visions, I had emotional comfort as well through the scripture, but I hadn't confessed. You actually have to confess before the people of this world. And I said, God, this is Matthew chapter 10, 29, through following. I said, God, I, I would have to give up my family. If I confessed to you, I would have to give up my family. You know what the next verses say? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And I, I, I said, God, it's, it's not just my family, it's everything, it's my life. Everything I know, everything I've worked for, if I became a Christian, I'd have to give it all up. You know what the next verses say? He who does not pick up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. The gospel has been a call to die from the very beginning. Let me repeat that. The gospel has been a call to die from the very beginning. Pick up your cross and follow me was not Christianese when Jesus said it. But can you imagine, for, from, from the perspective of a Muslim, for just one moment, can you imagine the notion of God dying for someone? God who remains apart from this world as if behind a veil, that God who created this universe just by thinking it into existence, the God who is all powerful, the creator of time and space, entered into it and suffered at the hands of his own creation. How does this make any sense? And when he entered into it, he entered as a child born to two children. We have to remember Joseph and Mary were very young born to two children who had been accused of an illegitimate relationship. Jesus bears the ignominy of being an illegitimate child. This is the God of the universe we're talking about. And then when he comes, he lives as a blue collar laborer. He could have come into the household of a king. No, he works with his hands in sweat and tears. And he ultimately gets 12 disciples in whom he invests his whole heart and they betray him, one of them with a kiss. Betray him to death and then he gets flogged. Have you ever read about the flogging process? What that's actually like? Cicero tells us that it was called the pre-death. That people were whipped such that their skin fell off their bodies in ribbons. People's abdominal walls were torn open, intestines fell out during the flogging process. Our God going through this and then placed on a cross. You know, the cross was designed to be the most humiliating, the most painful way to die ever in human history. We had to invent a word to describe how painful it is. Excruciating. Excruce means from the cross. This pain is what God decided to use this death he takes a look at all of human history and he says that death that execution is enough to show people what I want to show them what was he trying to show us through all this the depths of his love for us if you were born in an illegitimate relationship God understands and he loves you anyway. Enough to bear that with you. If you are trying to make ends meet, working hard, blue collar laborer, doesn't matter who you are, God loves you enough to take that burden upon himself. 
if the people you've invested yourself in said that they would love you till the day they died and then they left you in your moment of need. God's been through that. He loves you. If your body is broken and you're saying, God, why me? Why me, God? Jesus' body was broken on the cross out of love for you. Take a look at your heart. You know why? On the day you see your heart is desperately wicked in need of a savior, you could become an answer rather than just another question. This is the only answer in the world that offers you a savior. Where in the world did these four converge at a moment in history? Where did evil, justice, love, and forgiveness converge at a moment in history? I said, can I take you to a hill called Calvary and show you the person of Jesus Christ? who shows you the evil in your heart and mine, who was just and the justifier, who loved us so greatly to give himself for us. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. In the person of Jesus Christ. We have to remember what Jesus says in John chapter 15, as I have loved you, so love one another. Okay, this is, where, this is what it all boils down to at this point. God loves us tremendously. He was willing to go through all this to show us what love is, and then he charges us with loving one another with the same love. As I have loved you, so love one another. What does that mean? What does that look like? Romans chapter five, verse eight, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is willing to die for us when we're in active rebellion against him. The people who crucified him, Jesus says what in the Gospel of Luke? Forgive them, they know not what they do. The very people driving nails through him. And then we tend to skip over those verses in, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, if you are hungry, uh, if your enemy is hungry, give them something to eat. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Your enemy, who is it you're supposed to love? Just other people who love you? No, read the end of Matthew 5. Even the pagans love those who love them. You are called to love those who do not love you so that you can be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is the teaching we have been given. Jesus gave us the example of dying for our enemies and then he says, follow me. Now when we call ourselves Christians, what are we doing? We're taking God's name, Christ, and putting it on ourselves, Christian, little Christ. That's what it means. Now the Bible says very clearly, do not take the Lord's name in vain. That doesn't mean if you stub your toe, don't say, oh God. That's not what it means. It means do not bear the name of God and not live like God. This is how Christ lived. This is how he calls us to live. This is God's plan for saving this world. For 2,000 years, we've had God's plan of saving the world, which is the grace he gives us, the love he gives us, we pour forth because there's nothing that can stop this grace unless we don't pour it forth. And then I wonder whether we received it to begin with. There's no way I think you can receive the gospel, receive this much forgiveness from God and not love others. What am I trying to say to you? Do you only have intellectual realities about God? Have you never experienced Him? Have you never experienced Him? No intellectual argument will ever persuade me of what happened on that hospital bed when I was 17. The indwelling presence of the living Christ that transforms you, that gives you new hungers, gives you new life, new desires, new loves, as the old passes away. And I say to you, three wonderful things happen when you come to Christ. He forgives you, He changes you, He gives you the direction to follow Him, to get to the celestial city. Why are the problems only intellectual? Why don't you go back existentially and ask yourself, have I never experienced him? Have I never felt the reality of that transformation? We have eternity to worship God in bliss. We have eternity 
to live joyfully without pain. We have this short life, a blink of an eye, to preach Christ. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I realized, okay, believing the evidence, concluding, reaching the verdict that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, backed it up by returning from the dead, that's great, that's important, it's not enough. It's not enough. Believe plus receive. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. And when I would receive this free gift of his grace, then I would become a child of God. So I invite you right now, my friend, to accept the Messiah as your Savior. You breathe, but there is no guarantee that you will breathe tomorrow. Maybe you are young, but don't worry. There's many people, they are young and they die before the old one. Maybe you are 10 years old. Maybe you are 50 years old. Maybe you are 18 years old, but death come any moment, any second. And then you will not earn your salvation. I invite you right now as we speak to accept the Messiah, the amazing teaching of the Messiah, the Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah, Yeshua al Messiah, the only Savior, the one who says, love your enemy. The one who said, it's been said to you, but I say to you, for he have the authority. If somebody asks you for your code, give him your address. If somebody asks you to walk a step with him, walk with him 1,000. If somebody curse you, pray for him. Don't curse him and kill him. And every day I wake up and I wonder, what am I doing here? Why am I here? He said, today I have found my answer. I came here to find God and to find Jesus Christ in my life. One's focused on compassion, the other one's focused on truth. But we as Christians have been called to focus on truth and compassion. The fact of the matter is, even though these are the things that are found in the Quran, these are the things that are found in the Hadith, we are called as Christians to see Muslims as people, children made in the image of God, broken, apart from God, but still people who are image bearers of God. Are you with me? People are dying apart from God. We have been charged by God to preach his message. The great commission is to preach the message. For 14 centuries, we haven't reached the Muslim world. Up until a few years ago, we were sending one Christian missionary into the Muslim world per million Muslims. And the majority of them came back with less than 10 converts. So God is sending them here in droves. This is our opportunity. This is the unprecedented opportunity I was talking about to reach the world with the gospel because the world is coming here. And in the last 14 years, we have seen more conversions from Islam to Christianity than in the previous 14 centuries combined. You are part of a worldwide movement of the Holy Spirit, which for eternity we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about what we did here for eternity. Are you going to grab the Holy Spirit's hand, be led by him, and reach this world? Are you going to follow Jesus, or are you going to carry his name in vain? This is the task we've been given. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 1.6 billion. It's one out of every four people. Of them, 0.01% actively fight in the name of Islam. We are called by our God to receive these people. Muslims are poor people do not know what they are missing. and our duty as a Christian is to bring them to the truth.
we glorify the name of the Lord. For there is no name better than his name. And by the way, Christian prince is not a priest. I cannot even claim to be a person better than any one of you. And maybe more of, maybe all of you is better than me. But I do my best. I do my best to share the knowledge I have. So me, me, I can help some people to accept the Messiah and see the truth. The Lord, he said the truth. Look for the truth and the truth will set you free.